Before I introduce this uh, final panel, I really I just want to pause for a moment and offer a thank you, which I haven't done yet, to the um, hard work of the planning committee. Their names are listed in your program. Um, the success of this conference would not have been possible without their hard work. I'm deeply indebted um, to, to their support of this effort and also our event team for the assistance with the logistics. Um, and I want to thank all of you for your time and valuable insights and continuous engagement throughout the day. It's just fantastic to have you here. It's been a long day, I know. Um, so here we are, uh, our final and last panel of the day, our, our third research panel. Uh, this panel, we're going to look at the potential benefits and unintended consequences of using data and technology to inform financial decision making. So how financial institutions, consumers, and investors use and react to new technologies, particularly artificial intelligence and data aggregation. Um, which has raised hopes and concerns, as we've already heard throughout this con conference, for inclusion, wealth accumulation, and financial well-being. Our chair for this discussion is Penny Crossman, who is no stranger to this topic. Penny is editor-at-large at American Banker, so whether you've read her articles or listened to her podcasts, her deep knowledge of fintech and its role in banking becomes immediately apparent from her insightful questions and analysis. So thank you, Penny, so much for adding your experience to this discussion, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, These are really interesting topics. I think, I think of especially uh, the, the research papers on this panel are sort of testing some of the ideals and the myths around fintech. You know, does it really do all of the good that people think it should do? And you know, the answer is always it's going to be kind of. I think you know, in some ways. Yes, and in some ways there may be some uh, room for improvement. Um, so I'm going to start with just a little bit of a, um, a quick look at a few of the trends in fintech that um, these three researchers have kind of dived into. So the first one is the rise of robo-advising. Um, we saw uh, the birth of robo-advisors like uh, Betterment and Wealthfront a few years ago. And I, I was actually surprised last night to check the numbers to see that um, it's currently about 8.2 million Americans use robo-advisors, and that was a little lower than I thought. Uh, Betterment has about 400,000 users, and Wealthfront has about 270,000 users. Um, I did think those numbers would be higher just based on how long we've all been writing about and thinking about these things and how long these these companies have been around. But I think sometimes these things take sort of a hockey stick trajectory, like uh, digital banking, I think, started off slowly and then kind of shot up. Um, and uh, according to a survey conducted by Schwab, 58% of Americans expect to use a robo-advisor by 2025. So it could kind of um, escalate like that. Um, there have been concerns about robos that occasionally arise. Uh, I did a podcast with John Taft, the vice chairman at Baird, a little while ago. And he talked about the fact that um, there's been a huge kind of movement of uh, investing toward passive funds rather than actively managed funds over the past several years. And a lot of this has been during a uh, a bull market. So he worries about what happens if we really hit a um, a bear market. You know, could we, uh, you know, could this compound some sort of a meltdown? Um, could it lead to deeper declines, faster declines? Could there be some sort of scary scenario? Another red flag for robo-advisors came up last week when it was reported that SoFi sold customer shares out of their existing ETFs and into a couple of ETFs that Schwab itself owns. And ostensibly, this was for uh, tax benefits, but apparently the customers were not asked about this, and they weren't really told until five days later. So um, possible uh, policy concern for the future, um, and just something that makes you think, is, is this really in, in people's best interest? Um, I personally have always wondered, are robo-advisors the right thing for everyone? And um, uh, one of our uh, researchers like Pernanan Prabala has looked into that question pretty deeply and looked at a set of uh, ETFs and uh, how people's portfolios performed um, who use those ETFs versus people who don't use ETFs. So we will hear uh, more about that, which will be really interesting. A second trend is the rise of digital banking and uh, um, for, for incumbent banks as well as fintechs. You know, it's no surprise to anybody here. Uh, uh, Bank of America now has 27.1 million 
regular digital banking users, and there are 6 million people that use Erica, its uh, AI-based virtual assistant. And a lot of banks also have uh, been developing and rolling out very similar AI-based assistants, giving you advice and recommendations uh, through an artificial intelligence engine that reads and analyzes all of your current and past transaction uh, behavior. Uh, Wells Fargo has 23 million mobile users. Uh, Chase now has um, around 30 million, 33 million. Um, And among fintechs, we're seeing uh, an increase in adoption also. Um, 20 million people use Mint. Moneyline has 4 million users. Chime has close to 4 million users. Um, Capital has 420,000 users. So I know the banks used to feel like, oh, the fintech... um, you know, uh, banking providers are not uh, are not significant yet. They don't have market share, but they're actually getting there. So um, that's been kind of an interesting uh, thing. And we haven't seen a lot of um, dangers, I don't think. But uh, Bruce Carlin has looked at the question of uh, does the use of these apps that that mo- help you monitor your financial uh, transactions and accounts, does that lead to financial well-being, which I think is a really interesting question. He's going to uh, give us some answers on that. A third trend is the increase of money into venture capital. That's obviously been a big topic today. Um, in 2018, U.S. fintechs raised almost $12 billion from venture capital firms, and that's an increase of 120% from the year before. Um, but it's notoriously difficult for female startups, founders, to get VC money. Uh, Last year, 2.2% of VC money, uh, I think globally, went to female founders. And the year before, the number was exactly the same, 2.2%. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but um, 91% of decision makers at VC funds are female, so that's part of the uh, the the explanation for why this happens. Um, there are many theories about um, about the extremely low rate of, of female founder um, funding, but some of the theories are around you know VCs having kind of a group think, you know, of, of, of wanting to invest in people that look like them or people they can relate to, and. Um, there are also theories around women preferring to ask for loans versus uh, pitching to venture capitalists, and there are a number of other factors. But um, uh, we do have Harvard professor Ramana Nanda, who has analyzed a, a piece of this where he's looked at uh, things like product review sites and the way that venture capitals, venture capital people are affected by things like product reviews, which tend to come more from, um, not only come more from men, but also tend to um, favor products, or the VCs tend to gravitate toward products that are popular with men rather than women. So he's going to dive into that um, aspect of it. So um, hopefully that sort of sets the stage a little bit for these research uh, papers we're going to hear that are all really interesting. Let me just briefly introduce our three panelists. So we have Nangpurnanand Prabala, who is professor of finance at the John Hopkins Carey Business School. His studies in the fintech space have looked at robo-advising in the wealth management industry and the use of soft information, such as friendship networks in peer-to-peer lending. We have Bruce Carlin, who is a professor at UCLA and a director of the Financial Research Association. His work includes research on consumer behavior in retail financial markets, uh, the clarity of disclosures made by financial institutions and consumer financial literacy. So all uh, interesting policy uh, touching <laughs> areas. And Ramana Nanda is the Seraphim Rock Professor of Business Administration and co-director of the Private Capital Project at Harvard Business School. His research examines financing frictions facing new ventures. He aims to help entrepreneurs with fundraising and to shed light on how stakeholders can improve the odds of selecting and commercializing on the most promising ideas and technologies. And for our real person in the trenches, uh, giving her take, her perspective on all of this, 
Uh, we're fortunate to have Ashley Nag Nagel Eknayan, who is Senior Vice President of Eastern Bank, where she's the Chief Digital Strategist and Head of Eastern Labs. Eastern Labs is one of those somewhat smaller banks that has done some really innovative stuff. They have a, you know, they have their own innovation lab. They created uh, uh, software for making automated loans to small businesses in very short time frames in, within uh, within minutes. And they actually spun out that group into a, another company called Numerated. But Eastern Labs continues to innovate and um, and create its own technology. Uh, Ashley is also the program development chair for Brandeis University's Master's in Digital Innovation for FinTech program, which is the first program of its kind in the country. Um, so with that, let, I'm going to turn things over to Nagpurnanan Prabala. Thank you. And just a word, um, for this panel, we're going to have each person give their, uh, give their research, and then we're going to have a little bit of a discussion. I'm going to um, ask maybe one follow-up question or two with the researcher, and then have a little bit of a discussion with Ashley about how it resonates with her. And if during that, the course of that discussion, some, one of you has a question, please come to one of the podiums, and we'll try to uh, watch out for you and call on you. Thank you. Uh Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting uh, uh, me to speak on this. So I'm going to be talking about robo-advising and uh, I'll talk a little bit about the kind of robo-advising that we are concerned with uh, in this study. Then I'll discuss something about our own study, uh, what, what, what we actually find, and then I'll get to the takeaway. So uh, as background, you know, uh, household finance Financial planning is a complicated sort of creature. As even the previous panel, we had this discussion. There are lots of things that people need to worry about. And the previous panelists mentioned buying secondhand IKEA sofas. But there are many other things over here that go on. How much cash you want to keep, how you plan your taxes, what debt you take, your credit card managing, and lots of other things. The piece that we are looking at is very small, one part of it, which is wealth management. And uh, even in that, there are like uh, a bunch of different uh, pieces to it, which is investing uh, your stock portfolios, investing for retirement. We are just looking at one piece of it, and uh, as we'll sort of see very short. One problem with all of this is not only is the problem complicated, but households are not known to be financially sophisticated. You know, they make all kinds of mistakes, and uh, financial literacy is kind of weak. It's very interesting that uh, financial literacy is about as uh, weak in the U.S. as in any emerging markets, and a number of studies have been done on these things. So there's lots of room for advice as a result, and advice hopefully gets people to do a better thing. And there's lots of room for advice in any one of these pieces, you know, whether insurance, whether uh, what kind of insurance to buy, what mortgages uh, to take. Everywhere there's room for advice. And the industry is right now... Uh, I would say it has three characteristics. One is it's human capital intensive. It's mostly done through people. It's very fragmented. Uh, and uh, the last part of it is about wealth management. Most of it is targeted at people with substantial assets already under uh, a, a, a large AUM. And the reason is that because it's human intensive, uh, you've got to pay the advisors a lot of money. So they look only at wealthy populations. So the answer to that is uh, robo-advising. And a bunch of these robo-advisors have cropped up uh, over the last few years. And, uh, and I'm not going to go through each one of them. But basically, in each panel, you'll see that there's a B2B component and B2C component. Uh, and the B2B, uh, so one part of advising is you actually advise the investors on how they can do better. And the second is you create tools for the advisors themselves. And something, again, that came up in the last plan, and it's, it's all over the place. All of these uh, entities have cropped up. So what are we looking at in our study? We are looking at one piece of it, which is direct advisor, B2C advisor, which is administered to uh, retail financial investors. The uh, robo-advisor we are looking at has the same information as the human advisors. In fact, in the brokerage company that we are studying, 
uh, all interactions were through human advisors and uh, they kind of introduced the robo advisor uh, as an alternative as an offering to some of the investors and why did they try to do this type of automation one is that it's cheaper uh, second you know if you get have a cheap tool it allows you to expand your reach uh, to many more customers the other thing is that the execution and this was what they stressed was very simple if you give advice uh, the robo advice tool i will show you in a minute you press a button and it implements whatever advice you want this all the trades that are necessary get done at one click uh, one of the other things that was mentioned is that robo advising is not subject to any conflicts of interest that advisors have this i'm not not 100% sure of but uh, this was one of the selling points the main question we are asking is does this work what kind of effects it has and what we find is there are some expected effects and some unexpected effects and i will just quickly go through the results so i just want to preface the results by uh, you know some survey data on why do people like robo advising and you know the top reasons that uh, consumers cite are convenience and simplicity there are uh, some sort of people say that there's lower cost and there's some sense that robo advising is not worse than uh, human advising the one thing that you don't see in all of this is that robo advice is capable of producing better alpha or better returns you don't see that anywhere at all apparently consumers uh, you know don't believe that robo advisors can give them anything more so uh, the in the study that we are looking at we are looking at small investors who are not financially savvy these people can make systematic mistakes in their investment some of which we uh, will talk about shortly uh, in this the financial advising is expensive and they are potentially biased because the they are hired by the same brokerage company that gives robo advice uh, and robo advising what yeah, how can it help Uh, one is that it's cheap and easy to use and advisors are very costly long phone calls uh, before you do anything when you talk to clients and after you have all these long phone calls they may or may not do what you tell them to do and even if they do or do not do they end up blaming you for everything the advisor this is the kind of setting in which uh, robo advice was administered to the client so this was a full full service brokerage house house in india it has about a million clients and uh, it's a pretty big number many of these are active in around july 2015 they introduced a portfolio optimizer tool so what they were looking at in their setting was that a lot of investors were holding just one stock or two stocks a small number of stocks and they were telling the investors you're better off at diversifying and they sort of gave the uh, diversification tool it's a standard uh, mean variance optimization tool the sort that's used in the us uh, with some shrinkage it tells you what is your best portfolio given a set of questions you answer about your preferences and uh, it, if you choose to take up whatever the portfolio advisor says you press a button and the trades are implemented it also allows you to experiment you don't need to take up exactly what the robo advisor tells you you can play around with it and figure out what are the portfolios you would like to have and uh, whatever you choose in the end you just put in uh, your weights for your portfolio click one button and the trades get done uh, so this is kind of what they put up and this is very familiar to professors who teach uh, finance classes it's a mean variance frontier and each portfolio is located somewhere inside it so they tell you where your current port portfolio is where your proposed portfolio will go to and then it's up to you to do what what you want so what do we find so the first thing is that uh, the what surprised us is this considerable amount of uh, take up of robo advising uh, people who were offered used it experimented with it and changed their portfolios in response to that and this was a little surprising because other evidence before this shows that people are resistant to robo advice people don't use it as much and as we just heard even in the us uh, it's not clear whether 8 million is a big number or a small number but here uh, it was uh, used up and uh, many of the uh, small investors who are undiversified uh, actually end up taking up diversification advice which is an interesting point because many people believe that uh, being undiversified may be an optimal choice of investors well if it is then if you give them advice to diversify they should continue to stick where they are they don't uh, the most diversified investors uh, sort of uh, bring down the number of stocks in our study all investors have uh, the expected results if you have more stocks your volatility comes down 
and it comes down substantially for those with a uh, low number of initial stocks. No surprises there. Uh, investment returns improve a little bit uh, for uh, the less diversified investors. And the consistent message that you see out here is that the least diversified investors who had the worst positions actually benefit more from robo-advising. Or let me put it another way, they actually like to use, they don't mind using the robo-advice, they don't mind getting diversified uh, in the process. Uh, what is in it for the brokerage firm? So initially you look at it, you find that the fees that people pay go up because they trade more. And uh, and when you break up all of this, uh, uh, these results, you have least sophisticated investors who benefit most as they are supposed to. The news there is not that they do benefit. The news is that they take up the robo-advice uh, that is offered to them. The more sophisticated investors don't benefit uh, very much from this robo-advice. The interesting story out here, which is which led us to this question. So, what is in it for these sophisticated investors? Do they gain anything from here? So, the, we looked at uh, the behavioral biases that investors uh, display, and we looked at three types of behavioral biases. But you can think of them as in falling in two categories. Investors don't make buy decisions rationally; they make it sub-rationally. Investors also do sell decisions sub-rationally. They sell when they should not sell and what they should not sell. Uh, and they buy things based on trend chasing. Uh, so we looked at what happens to all these sorts of biases. Now the experiment here, I just want to be very clear. You're given robo-advice, they buy something, they hold it, and after that they can do what they want. They can buy more, they can sell more based on their own uh, choices. It's not what the algo tells them from that point on. So what we find uh, out here is that the biases of all sorts decline for investors. So you give them an education on mean variance frontier, teach them something about portfolio optimization, and you find that you know all their tendencies to behave suboptimally in their buy and sell decisions in the future come down. And this declines not only for uh, small investors with low number of stocks, but it also declines for uh, sophisticated investors also. And there's a little bit of things that uh, uh, academics are concerned about causal identification. We kind of identify... Uh, the treatment effect by looking at everybody who's called, some of them happen to have missed calls, some of them don't have missed calls, and we track both of these investors, and we find that all the effects that we see in terms of declining irrationality is concentrated in the uh, people who use the robo-advisor. So, you know, where does this leave us? Traditional view is that everybody knows what they want to do, that's the libertarian view, and the other view is the Dick Thaler view, that you give them a nudge towards... Uh, uh, rationality works and notably in uh, by changing default choices you make pe people uh, make sensible default choices and their inertia keeps them um, healthy so what we are suggesting is that robo advising at least in the setting we have is somewhat better uh, it, it, it is an alternative I don't want to say it's better you give people the choice educate them and then see what they do and give the important thing is that you have easy implementation of whatever choices you make. It seems to work. The last part of the study, and this is a new part, uh, is what happens to human advising when you give robo-advising. And this is something that we are continuing to investigate. So uh, some of the advisors say that we don't expert the ro expect the robots to displace human advisors anytime soon. And this is a view that others have also expressed. And uh, when you look at uh, uh, using robo-like uh, advisors in other areas, uh, the re there's some research on when people use and when people don't use uh, robots. People are willing to trust uh, machines for things like Netflix. What movie should I watch tonight? Whatever Netflix recommends seems good to me. And uh, people behave like that. Same thing on Amazon purchases also. And we have some uh, uh, discussion of that. And uh, But things where decisions are supposed to be more subjective, people trust machines less. Uh, driverless cars, a car is number one. That people just don't seem to trust uh, them that much, despite all the hoopla that they have uh, received. And the other thing that you see is they lose trust in these algos uh, very quickly for subjective uh, decisions. So what do we see in our setting? Actually, what we looked at is we looked at the interactions between humans and clients in two ways. We have data on calls, call length, call transcripts, all kinds of data, and trades after call. So this is the initial evidence. What you find is that uh, the demand for human advising actually goes up. 
after uh, for all those who take up robo advising so they make uh, the top panel out there tells you uh, on client initiated calls they're more likely to initiate calls and they spend longer times talking to advisors and the lower uh, panel discusses the length of advisor initiated calls when advisors call humans uh, their clients after robo advising again the demand seems to go up the interactions go much much longer they talk much longer and we are kind of now uh, trying to flesh out these results in some more detail to seeing what exactly are they talking about and actually does this translate into some sort of uh, 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 some sort of trading action when they talk to advisors this time are they more likely to use uh, uh, whatever advice or not this joint work with francesco and alberto my colleagues at maryland let's talk thank you uh, one quick follow up for you is do you think if you had done this study in the US with uh, some of the uh, robos here, which are kind of usually focused on ETFs, and, and with the market here, um, which is generally people in their 30s and 40s um, who invest in these, do you think you, you would have had very similar results and conclusions? I'm not sure. It's a good question uh, to ask. The thing that I will say is that the characteristics of the investors and especially the portfolios they hold are identical, first order, to what okay. uh, individuals hold out here. That's a good, good, good indicator. Um, so, Ashley, you know, as a banker, you know, you're currently with a uh, with Eastern Bank. You were at State Street before that. What's your reaction to the the rise of the robos? How do you feel it's how do you feel, feel about the effect it's having on investors and on the financial community? Uh, yeah, so I think when I think about the advent of robo advisors and this new technology, really democratizing, not to use a buzzword, but democratizing wealth management, giving people access to the markets and tools and a segment of the population that really wouldn't have access to it, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, this is what you want technology to do in the information age. You want it to provide access. And I think we are we're seeing when the robos first came out, like the sky is falling, right? Robos are going to take, the robots are coming. They're going to take over the world. There's not going to be human advisors anymore. And now what you're seeing is sort of hybrid models. So we go from sort of the pendulum swings, right? When they first come out, everyone's sort of afraid of them. Then people say they could never replace humans. And now you see some really great uh, hybrid models where you have uh, the robos doing sort of the asset allocation. And then as the, the research shows, right? You have humans sort of coming in for those more complex questions, those more complex insights. So I think it's a really good meshing of when, you know, technology can really automate and, and help, help those advisors spend time on the questions that robots can't solve, something simple like asset allocation. Um, I think you mentioned a couple red flags too, you know, and, and you kind of have to step back to say, okay, well, you know, should everyone be using a robo-advisor just because you have access to it? Is that really the best solution for you? Um, and I think as a, as a bank, you know, you start to think about, huh, well, um, you know, and I think some of the, the VC panelists said this beforehand, you know, if you're a fintech, you kind of come out with one product. We're going to do a robo advisor, but what's next on your roadmap? You know, maybe you're thinking about account aggregation. Okay, you're going to plug in your bank accounts. Maybe you're going to add some lending. Maybe you're giving people a dashboard where they're seeing their whole financial picture, and you, as a bank, you kind of get pushed down on the value chain, right? And you get more separated from your customers and the value and that experience that they're having digitally. Um, so it's a it's a really interesting space and something that we're certainly keeping our eye on. Yeah, Betterment has said they want to offer pretty much everything, right. everything financial a consumer could possibly want. And also it was interesting, I thought, that the um, the need for human advisors went up among the people using the the robo, and it's which is good news for investors, but probably not so good for the Wall Street for, or the, the companies that think they're going to save a lot of money by not having to have a lot of people um, offer hands-on advice. Uh, so... Uh, Bruce, you've been very patient. <laughs> oh, let's go to your research. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Um, all right, so everybody on that side of the room is thinking about: Does technology actually work? Does it help us? And everybody on that side of the room is sitting there thinking to themselves: Well, 
if we give people access to more information, is that going to make their lives better? And so we can all talk about fintech, but this is a very hard problem to tackle because we have to try to figure out with the growth growth of this new technology, are people going to be better off and make better decisions? Okay, and that's at the heart of things. Empirically, this is a very hard thing to disentangle because there's a lot of moving parts all going on at the same time. Academics love to call this endogeneity, but to pin down what's happening and what you know whether the technology and the adoption of technology is is useful that's a really hard thing to do typically okay so what we're going to do in this paper is actually use data from a financial aggregation uh software uh and we're going to show how technology affects decision making and you know we're going to show that there's some pretty substantial effects on the financial health of people but we're also going to document some of the mechanisms by which this happens and how people of different generations behave. Okay? And so we're going to use data from Iceland. And so in that part of the world they collect data on everything you do. Okay? And so now what's nice about Iceland is it's a pretty homogeneous place. I mean, if you've watched the World Cup soccer, you you know this to be the case. Okay? And so um there are about 300,000 people including children living there and so it turns out that about 25 to 30% of the population uh of a, of adult population uses this financial aggregator software so we can look at how changes in that technology affect the population at large okay and it turns out that people who live in Iceland they almost never use cash so we are able to monitor not only what transactions that they make uh the financial penalties that they pay their bank accounts and the logins that they use and which devices they use and importantly as of november 2014 people had been using a desktop to log in and then they would make decisions as of november 2014 all of a sudden there was an app that was exogenously introduced and therefore we can take a look at what was the effect of the improved access to this technology on information decision making how you use credit etc okay and so that's what we did now this is the financial aggregation app um it's similar to mint.com uh Iceland's a little bit a- ahead in that the majority of the population does use this um but this is growing in the US as well so just from the raw data as of 2014 in November the the frequency of logging in jumped and so there is a discontinuity where you see that access to information all of a sudden people are actually using it okay or at least accessing it now what's also important about this app is it only provides you access to information it does not provide you easier transactions so any effects that we're going to see are going to be based on having more info as opposed to easier you know opportunities in the market now one of the things when you think about welfare and i think one of the gentlemen at table 2 brought this up is that you have irrational behavior in the market you have people with different utility functions and so forth one of the things that we can sort of all o- agree on no matter what your utility function is is that we don't like to pay interest and we also don't like to pay penalties okay and so if we can show that access to this information actually causes those things to go down most people unless you've got a very odd utility function and you like fees your your utility is going to go up okay and so just from the raw data you can see right around the introduction of this app you see that the overdraft interest fees go down and the late fees start to go down okay and so exogenously you introduce this app to people who are already using the technology and all you not only see higher logins but now you start to see penalties going down and this suggests that there's a positive welfare effect okay 
And so what we do in the paper is formally we, we perform a regression discontinuity and time design. What that means is, is we look at people, individuals over time, and around the introduction of this app, we see how their behavior changes. Okay? And so uh, we don't think that the timing of the app has anything to do with individual people, whether it was November, December, January. Um, but since we can it, look at individuals, we know the people who they're logging in, we can actually introduce characteristics called intro individual fixed effects to control for all kinds of other things that might change their behavior around this introduction of this app. Okay, and so with this in mind, what we do is we, we can now calibrate the magnitude of this effect. And so what we show is that every extra login was associated with roughly $2 fewer penalties paid per month over a two-year period of time. Now, $2 may not seem like a lot, but this is per login per month over a 24-month period, and it's a cross-section of the population. A lot of people, this turns out to be quite a lot of money, okay? Now, in terms of the how these penalties are split up, it turns out that a reduction in overdraft interest accounted for most of this effect, okay? And that other types of fees, late fees and things like that, were less important, but still important. Now, this led us to look at, because we could see in the data, how were people using credit cards how much were they paying off their monthly balances? We could see this. And so what we were able to show was that the logins, the higher logins, were in fact associated with a reduction in overdraft interest and an increase in credit card use. And within this setting, use of the credit card offers a 30 to 50 day float. So ostensibly what people were doing was they were more aware of what was in their accounts, they were borrowing on their credit cards to pay for things, and lowering their overdraft interest that they were paying, um, leading to an overall reduction in financial penalties. So we view this as an important uh, result. Now, if we start looking across generations, this basically shows you, this figure shows you the uptake of the technology by different types of people of different de generations. So we divided people into millennials, uh, baby boomers, and uh, Generation X, okay? And the millennials, not surprisingly, took up the uh, technology the fastest, followed by the Gen Xers, followed by the baby boomers. And also of interest, uh, was that men tended to take up the technology faster than women, but within category, millennial women were quite quick compared to baby boomer men, okay? Um, now, if we look at the financial penalties that are paid, the baby boomers and the Gen Xers tend to in tended to incur higher financial penalties than millennials. Okay, and so they were much higher, uh, much more likely to have overdraft interest. They were more likely to incur late fees and NSF fees. Now, at the same time, the older generations, the baby boomers and the Gen Xers, were more liquid. They had higher cash reserves compared to millennials. And so there's a, a co-holding puzzle that's very important uh, in consumer finance, where people have cash, but uh, and plenty ca of cash, but still incur all of these, you know, late fees and in in high interest payments and so forth, when they could use their cash to just pay those things down. Okay, and so it turns out in our setting that the the baby the older generations were much more likely to have a co-holding uh, distortion than millennials. And what we think is probably happening is that the technology is affecting them differently.
Um, so, you know, where does this kind of lead us? Well, first of all, you know, at least in this setting, as we look at, you know, financial aggregation software, access to more information does appear to allow people to make better decisions and may even change the way they access credit, which is a good thing. Okay. And, and now if we start to think forward, how are we going to use this? You know, well, it'll affect people of different gener generations differently. Okay. And so perhaps, you know, we need to devise different instruments for different generations and perhaps improve the delivery for older generations, because many people who have grown up with, you know, reading books and magazines and things like this, they're not used to a lot of these fancy gadgets. They don't adopt them as quickly, and perhaps they don't use them as efficiently. And so introducing fintech may not necessarily just be around, let's get things done faster, quicker, easier access, it may also be around knowing the target population and and perhaps offering a different product for people of different generations and, and backgrounds. We've heard a little bit of that uh, before. The last thing um, is that, you know, I've done a lot of work on the complexity of financial products. And so complexity is a, is a big issue. Um, and, and people have kind of raised this. I think Prabala also raised this as well, where you have you know very complex decisions, and the aggregation is a good idea, uh, but as long as everything is salient, so people can actually not only aggregate but distill, I think is going to be important for fintech to have uh, a, you know a big impact. So that's it. Awesome, thank you. I, you know, I'm just sort of curious. Oh, yes. I'm kind of curious about those baby boomers who had the higher cash flow, but also had the higher NSF fees. Are these, is, is from a behavioral psychology point of view, is this people who are kind of living beyond their means in a way? They, you know, they have money, but they're spending it all too quickly? Is it's, it's hard to, from the, wait a second, I think people can still hear me. Um, from the data, even though it's really detailed data, it's unbelievably detailed, we can't disentangle that. So we don't know why, um, but it's been documented by a lot of previous people, this co-holding puzzle, where even though you have the cash, you still take out the debt. Now, you know, from if in corporate finance, we people like to think of doing that because, well, debt is a tax shield and you can save on debt and that's a terrific thing to do. But from a personal standpoint, it's not a great thing to do. So, uh, but it looks like it's exacerbated um, in the baby boomer population. And also, again, do you feel that if you did this study in the U.S., you'd probably see similar themes? Yeah. I mean, one of the things you think about is, well, with such a homogeneous population like you have in Iceland, is that going to translate into the U.S. where we have a much more header? We have a melting pot. And, um, of course, from a research standpoint, having the homogeneous population is great. Um, I personally think that this would translate into the U.S., but the point about the different generations accessing this differently, I think you would probably get different people of different backgrounds accessing this differently. And FinTech directed at the different backgrounds I think is going to be a winner. Mm -hmm. I think it, to, 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 to really have the welfare effects that we want. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so, Ashley, I wanted to ask you, um, what are, what, in your experience, are you seeing a connection between people who use Eastern Bank's mobile app regularly or a lot? And uh, pe those pe are those people able to improve their financial health as they go? Yeah, that's a hard question to answer because we don't have the aggregation capabilities and we're not asking customers, you know, we, we basically just know balance. Um, however, more broadly, we do offer some financial literacy um, products and services to help people kind of understand the implications of debt 
and credit and how things work. And I think a more educated population where you have you have the ability to have these fintechs come in and really solve a job to be done, right? Like who likes paying fees, as Bruce said? Um, if people don't understand financial products and they're getting more and more complex, as Bruce mentioned. So if I'm a fintech and I'm coming in and saying, hey, I'm going to help you, right? I'm your friend. I'm a bank with a heart um, (laughs) because all of us bankers are heartless, not me, but most. Um, So how do you, you know, how do you start to compete with that, right? From a product development perspective, when you have a new digitally enabled product, you know, you're educating the customer, you're helping them make better financial decisions. And that's something that you care about. And, you know, uh, a bank that's not caring about that. So whether or not you believe that it's your job to solve financial literacy or it's an industry problem or it's a societal problem, which came up with an earlier panel, I, I totally agree. Like, those are, those are big questions. But you have to look at it from the customer perspective. Is this a problem that they are looking to solve? And if it is, they are going to go to the solution provider whether that's a fintech or a bank that's providing that, that's going to give that to them. So I think a huge, a huge sort of question mark for the industry and something that all, um, you know, all banks and financial institutions need to be, you know, looking out for. Like, does does that solve a customer need? And I think it does. Sure. Thank you, uh, Ramana. You've been really patient. Uh, Ramana is going to take a, a really interesting look at gender bias in venture capital. So um, please welcome Ramana. Thank you. So uh, thank you all for, uh, for, for inviting me, for, for sticking along uh, for the, to the bitter end here. Um, so my uh, uh, presentation here today is actually, uh, on the face of it, neither about fintech nor about uh, banking. But I hope that you will see uh, uh, very clearly the connections between what I'm going to be finding uh, and a lot of the themes that we've been talking about uh, today. So the, the motivation uh, for uh, this paper uh, really stems from the fact that consumer reviews are increasingly being used by financiers, as we've seen uh, in many of the earlier panels, uh, as signals uh, that they can use to make investment decisions. And that could be either at the peer-to-peer sense, or it could be for fintech lenders. Uh, certainly, uh, in venture capital, which is the context that I have been uh, studying uh, has begun to kind of think about measures of traction uh, as uh, early stage indicators of whether or not they should be making uh, investment decisions. Okay. Now, um, the thing to uh, to note is that people who review on these online platforms they select in. No one's forcing them to to review, uh, and they select in, and they will typically not represent the the population that they are supposed to represent in exactly the same proportion. Uh, as uh, as that population. Okay, so uh, in the context that I'm going to be studying, uh, women are about 10% of the reviewers, but obviously 50% of uh, the consumers uh, in the broader population. And so as we think about the ways in which the preferences of people are aggregated, uh, sort of a naive preference aggregation where we just say we'll just add up all the votes, uh, can lead to uh, interesting uh, systematic biases uh, in the way in which uh, the reviews, uh, the aggregated reviews, end up being uh, reported by these by, by these platforms. So um, obviously, uh, th- this is not a, a new thing. We, we, uh, in, uh, entrepreneurs will go and pitch to investors all the time, and investors have their own preferences. Uh, but what's particular about online platforms, I will argue, is that they broadcast these signals widely. And because of the fact that these online platforms have these network effect properties that make them winner take all, uh, the fact that there is this sort of bias signal being uh, uh, developed on one of these platforms means that if everyone is using the same traction uh, metrics to make their investment decisions, uh, you can have the systematic bias that creeps in in a way that wouldn't happen if everyone was having individual meetings with different people who had different questions and different uh, and, and, and different sets of preferences. Okay? So that's kind of the, the, the motivation here. Uh, what, what's our setting? Our setting is uh, 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 an online platform called Product Hunt. Uh, this is an important venue for launching and beta testing uh, technology-related products. It's uh, largely used by, te- uh, by startups, but uh, tech companies also launch uh, their, their new products. So you'll see uh, you know, Stripe or, or LinkedIn or Facebook and others put new products onto, onto the platform. 
Um, and as, as I mentioned, there's certainly anecdotal evidence that uh, VCs, particularly at the early stage, are looking for indications of traction. So uh, an entrepreneur shows up and says, I was ranked number two on Product Hunt uh, the day that I, that I, that I launched. That's a, you know, that's a sign that, that they actually have a product that was valued by consumers, that showed that there was traction, and, and is worthy of then uh, taking a meeting uh, to, to, to do for the diligence. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at products that were launched on Product Hunt, and then we're going to measure the follow-on VC financing that these uh, uh, startups uh, received uh, within about six months of launching on the platform. Okay? And what we're going to do is examine the degree to which uh, products that are uh, relatively more appealing to women uh, consumers uh, are uh, faring relative to those that are more appealing to male consumers and how that varies uh, based on the number of men and women who are showing up on the platform. Okay? Um, so what's the data? We're going to use uh, three years of data uh, for about uh, 40,000 products. So that's about 250 uh, products a week. Uh, and we're going to restrict it to technology products, which are web apps, mobile apps, hardware. So we're going to be taking, for those of you who know Product Hump, we're going to be taking books and podcasts out uh, uh, of the of the of, of the set because of the uh, certain features of uh, they're not very frequently reviewed. Okay. Now what we have is uh, individual person level identifiers, so you need to log into the website to be able to vote, so we know who you are, uh, and uh, we know the time of the vote, which will allow us to uh, also get a sense of when you logged onto the website. And at the moment, we're going to be using that to infer uh, which products you looked at but didn't vote on based on products that had launched. Uh, prior to your login that you were, uh, you know, you could have seen and voted on, but you chose not to. Okay. Now, we have, uh, the, 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 there's an interesting feature of this website. It, there's a focus on community. People are encouraged to kind of put their names, and in, indeed, in, in a large uh, fraction of the, of the uh, situations, we actually have the names of uh, the people who are engaged rather than you know, RN305, which is obviously certain accounts which are going to be hard to code the gender on. Uh, but uh, we have three uh, sets of con constituents. We're going to have the voters. So these are the members of the community who will upvote or not uh, a certain product. We have the makers. That's the last uh, uh, bullet point. These are what you could think of as the entrepreneurs. And then there's this uh, middle category uh, that is going to be important for our analysis. Uh, these are... Uh, hunters, so in order to be voted on on Product Hunt, someone has to hunt your, your product. Okay? And, uh, we will, and we're going to think of these hunters uh, and, and as, as sort of early indications of consumers who value these products, who, who find them interesting. Uh, and, and, and by sort of looking at the gender of the hunters, we're going to try to get a sense before the votes actually happen whether this particular product would have been more or less appealing uh, to women uh, consumers. Now, obviously, this is noisy, right? There's going to be uh, some male hunters who are going to hunt products that, will, that would be more appealing to women and, and vice versa. But uh, I'm going to hope to convince you that there's some signal here that's going to be useful for, for our analysis. Okay? So just to give you some uh, 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 high-level descriptives, as you know, uh, as I mentioned, there's about 40,000 products. Uh, 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 about 90% of them were hunted by, uh, by male hunters, about 10% were hunted by females. Uh, both sets of products uh, received about the same number of views. Both sets of products were featured at about the same percentage. So uh, Product Hunt has the opportunity to curate certain products, uh, and they were uh, you know, curating them and featuring them at the same rate. And obviously, we're going to be controlling for that in our analysis. Um, in about half the cases, the, the, the maker is actually listed on the website. Now, what's interesting is conditional on having a maker listed, you can see that female hunted products have a much higher share of female makers. Okay, so there is some, uh, already you can begin to see that there is some homophily here. Uh, the kinds of uh, products that are made by females are perhaps more uh, interesting to female hunters, but note that 50% of the products that uh, these uh, females are hunting don't have any. Uh, female entrepreneur. Okay, so there's a lot of variation in our data. Um, males uh, tend to uh, upvote uh, male hunted products a little bit more than females, and females tend to upvote female hunted products more than males. And that's perhaps not surprising if you begin to you know sort of see the fact that uh, the, the gender of the hunter is 
is correlated with what these consumers might, might find interesting. Okay? And that's sort of the variation that I'm going to be using uh, in my analysis. Okay, so just a very quick, I'm not going to get into the, to the fancy econometrics here, but essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to control for the attractiveness of a product by studying how many, you know, how many people voted for that product. And I'm going to study the fixed harshness of a reviewer by looking at how many times I tend to upvote conditional on the sets of products I see. So if I'm a particularly lenient voter, I can control for that because remember I know the identity of the voter. If I'm a particularly harsh voter, I can control for that. And what I'm going to do is going to take those sort of fixed effects out and what I'm going to have left is uh, an individual specific assessment for a given product that controls for my fixed harshness and for the fixed attractiveness of that product. Okay? And I'm going, to a I'm going to aggregate that up by whether or not uh, the, the voters are males or they're female. And you can see here, uh, on average, uh, males and females are very, very close in their assessment across all sets of products. Okay? So these residuals are essentially you know, centered around zero. On average, we're not, not too harsh or not too lenient, our, or on average, our assessments are, are, are about zero. Uh, and the, the chart on the right is essentially documenting the sort of the difference between uh, the, the, the male and the, fe and the female uh, reviewer scores on average. Okay? But this uh, sort of average is actually masking a, a, a lot of heterogeneity. Okay? So what you can see here is that the, the left uh, bar, which is sort of the all, the average, again, uh, is tiny, but you have uh, a, a very, very, very large difference that's showing up for female hunted products, uh, and a similar uh, opposite effect that's showing up for male hunted products. Uh, but remember, because female hunted products are about 10% of the sample, that very, very large negative number is being multiplied by only 10%, uh, and that uh, relatively small positive number is being multiplied by 90% to get the approximately zero uh, overall effect. Okay, and so uh, this is essentially the variation that we're going to be uh, studying, which is, in, in some ways, what we're saying is that female hunted products are liked a lot more by females relative to males, uh, and male hunted products are liked a little bit more by males relative to females. Okay? Now, uh, you know, I don't want to, one can easily uh, kind of uh, get, get into stereotypes here. And, and, and I'm going to do that for a second. So these are some among the top male, uh, relatively most interesting products for males. Okay, and we have Soylent here, uh, which is uh, you know, for those of you who know these tech bros who are kind of like so into doing their tech tech coding that they don't even want to take a, a break to have a meal, and they're going to have you know Soylent, and that's kind of that that's so so that's uh, uh, one of the products that are over here. You can see the kinds of things they care about are really a lot about technology, about coding, about developing apps. Um, so products that are more appealing to women voters, uh, uh, obviously there are certain products that are just uh, you know uh, very useful for women consumers. Period. Um, but um, the, the, what's interesting to note about this uh, uh, about this product is that this is a product that was developed by all male entrepreneurs. Okay, so so this is not always going to be about the gender of the entrepreneur. This is going to be about what consumers actually find interesting. And you'll see here that. Some of these are not obvious things that you might have thought, oh, this is going to be super uh, you know, interesting for a woman consumer relative to a male consumer. But it seems as if the kinds of things that are showing up here are much more related to travel, related to health, uh, and other features, not as much focus on, on coding. Okay? So I want to just uh, emphasize one quick thing, which is that this uh, difference that we're finding actually shows up even when you restrict it to only male makers. Okay, so this is not just about the gender of the entrepreneur. This is something about the consumers as proxied by whether this is uh, hunted by male or female that really be seems to be showing up as we think about the, the differences and the preferences across these voters. Okay? So um, I don't have time today to kind of show you these follow-on effects, but what we find is that on days when there is uh, a smaller share of women on the platform, uh, female hunted uh, products are going to get fewer upvotes. Uh, and then we also find on, de on days when there is a smaller share of women on the platform, uh, startups with products that were hunted by women are less likely to subsequently raise VC 
uh, six months, within six months of being featured, okay? And uh, there's a whole set of questions around, is there reverse causality? Is there omitted variable bias? And so on and so forth. Uh, uh, we're, this is uh, at, at still at an early stage, so I'm not going to tell you conclusively that I have uh, causal effects here, but uh, I, 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 I certainly find the patterns uh, to be quite interesting, and, and we're kind of working through those uh, uh, findings right now. Okay, so the, the summary of the findings so far that I've presented are that the, there are these strong gender differences in the types of technology products that are appealing to reviewers on Product Hunt. Uh, these differences appear linked uh, to the consumers rather than just to the gender of the entrepreneurs. Uh, and the, the aggregation of preferences uh, appears to lead to these uh, you know, biases where uh, products that are uh, uh, hunted by, uh, by women are doing less well on days when there's fewer women voters who are showing up on the platform. Okay. Now, uh, wh how, you know, putting it all together, I sort of want to leave you with three broad thoughts here. Okay? So the first is um, we have uh, relatively few gatekeepers who are responsible for kind of financing and commercializing uh, new ideas and technologies, and they're going to be using signals to make their investment decisions. And those signals are going to be obviously you know, noisy signals. Um, but uh, the, it's important to realize that you, know, you can have bias that arises, the signals that they're using can have bias in them purely from preference aggregation uh, without any discrimination or malicious intent. And the kinds of preference aggregation here where we're talking about just adding up upvotes is a very common way in which a lot of rankings happen, whether it's on you know, uh, Yelp or Reddit or other places like that. Uh, and so we kind of have to think, uh, the more we start using online platforms, the more we want to start thinking a little bit carefully about how we're aggregating these preferences of, of reviewers. Uh, I think it, it provides a little bit of a, a nuanced perspective on uh, online platforms. Uh, they obviously dem democratize access, as we've talked about, but also can impact who gets funded and hence kind of the direction of innovation. And then finally, uh, you know, we talk a lot about uh, the gender of the entrepreneurs who are getting, uh, not getting financed, and obviously that is a, a big concern, but it's sort of worth thinking about the fact that uh, ultimately if there is some uh, homophily between entrepreneurs and consumers, if women entrepreneurs are bringing products to the market that are important for women consumers, then uh, the, the consequences that we have of uh, this uh, uh, you know, imbalance in terms of who's getting funded is, is even bigger than just the entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, and so obviously that has sort of much uh, broader and deeper uh, welfare consequences. Okay, so with that, thank you very much. Do you see the product review sites making any kind of effort to recruit more female uh, reviewers or product hunters? Um, so I actually know the, the, the folks uh, who run this uh, well, and uh, I think one of the things that we're going to be working through together is to try to understand how best we can um, you know, think about what, what this means for the community. Because... Uh, you know, you don't want to force people to come onto the platform. People come on based on their interests. That's one of the nice things about these platforms. And it's not clear, uh, I think, uh, as we were talking before, it's not clear that you want to even have a different aggregation rule, right? Because one of the things that is nice about this is that it's simple and it's transparent. And you kind of say, look, uh, we understand that there's going to be noise in this process. Buyer beware. Let's make you aware of these things. Uh, but if we take a different approach, which is say, to say, we're going to try to tell you the truth, uh, we're going to try to deal with this set of biases, well, what about other biases that have not been factored in here? Uh, what about, you know, how do we think about those? And the more we start trying to uh, turn it into a black box, uh, perhaps uh, the less um, good this is doing to, to, to the users. Uh, so I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. I don't have the answers, but it's something that I'm hoping to kind of work through with, with the team uh, to think about how, you know, to understand how they're thinking about it and, and perhaps examine different ways to, to deal with it. All right. I'm going to ask Ashley a question or two, but then uh, we're going to go to the audience for questions in just a minute. Um, Ashley, I don't know. I know you work with uh, entrepreneurs, fintech entrepreneurs. I don't know if you work with any that have products designed for women. I sort of 
doubt it because there aren't that many financial products designed for women. Um, but what are you seeing in this whole space in terms of um, products, you know, fintechs with or, or tech companies with products for women getting more funding and also the um, this sort of imbalance of uh, funding going toward male entrepreneurs versus female? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think that the 2.2% 2 per, 2 .2 funding stat just makes me sad, right? Like there's, there's obviously something going on. And when you, when you look about, when you look at it broadly, you try to think about, okay, well, uh, the stats you mentioned, right? 90, 91% of VC firms are male. There's got to be some group think, there's got to be some bias towards people that look like you. Um, and you think, Okay, well, you know they can hire more women. They can put more people on uh, women on boards that they they have. They can um, install more CEOs that are women, and those are all good things. Then you sort of see this idea with Product Hunt, and you say, Ah, technology—that's the answer, right? Like, let's let's let consumers choose, right? You think that would be a more fair, fairer approach? And I think what um, Romana's research has shown is that, you know, technology itself is unbiased. But when you have people running, putting the models together, when you have the aggregation capabilities, a human is behind that. So you really do need to think through those sort of unintended consequences or the buyer bewares to say, okay, you know, this is what, uh, you know, aggregating in this way is going to do to that data. And I think um, that sort of filters through whether you're talking about, you know, funding for female entrepreneurs or just financial products in general. When you talk about models, you can kind of take this and sort of extrapolate and say, okay, well, any, any, type, any type of model that you're doing, there's humans or programmers behind that, that they're putting their own unconscious bias behind. And how do you look for that? How do you test for that? How do you monitor it? How do you let people know and make that transparent? You don't want things in a black box, but how do you bring that transparency to light? And how do you make sure that your outcomes are what is intended and you're not throwing off weird signal, right? Does it, does it end up that you are no longer, um, you know, funding people most in need? You know, are you discriminating against minorities? You know, are you not giving mortgages to millennials? You know, you, you have to sort of think about all these things, especially in terms of, you know, financial products and services getting more complex and getting more AI powered, quote unquote. So I, I don't have, you know, um, stats in terms of like women with financial products. I do know a couple of founders and, you know, it, it is a struggle, right? Even though they're rock stars. Um, but I think generally, you know, you see Romana's research really kind of extrapolating towards the use of models and, and how do we deal with this as an industry and how is how do regulators deal with it? And how do you make sure that the customer isn't isn't harmed? in a way. Look beneath the surface a little bit of some of these, some of these numbers. Any questions from the audience? All right. I guess you guys have covered it all. Um, um, yeah, it has been, it has been a very uh, cerebral day, very long day. Um, well, I'll just wrap this up with a few final questions. And if anybody has a question, come on up. Uh, that uh, for you, and I'll use your last name because I probably butchered your first name, <laughs> Rubella. Um, what would you like to see when you look at the robo-advising space looking forward? Are there any changes you would like to see uh, the providers of robo-advisors make, uh, perhaps in terms of being more clear about who would, who would best benefit from their product or, um, or anything? Is there anything you would like to see them do differently? So the one thought is uh, transparency of what goes on in the black box. Uh, and it's kind of a subtle question because when you go to human advisors also, you don't know how exactly they arrive at their decisions. And so, but the same thing arises in uh, robo-advising because there are obvious conflicts of interest in the way humans are compensated. And the question is, are they uh, robots, uh, these robots conflict-free or not? So some degree of transparency is probably necessary, but I don't know what to, how to get there. That makes sense. <laughs> and for you, Bruce, what would you, what, if anything, would you like to see uh, providers of um, these kinds of apps that provide account access and account information, uh, bank account information <clears throat> to consumers um, do uh, to kind of resolve some of the things you talked about, um, about the uh, people who ended up paying higher fees and such? 
I mean, I think the name of the game is in sim- simplicity. Um, I mean, people are daunted by financial products, borrowing, mortgaging, investing. Um, and even that screenshot that I showed you of all their accounts all coming into one screen, that's nice. But the fact is, is that people are still going to look at that and go, wow, that's that's a lot. Um, and so things, making things simple. I, I thought that one of uh, the findings in Prabala's research that I found to be most like invigorating was the fact that the people who were participating with the robots, this was increasing their 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 search for advice. And so in some in some way, the robot was making them feel like they could participate in a reduced form or simple way. And then they learned and they got better and they could then look for advice and participate. And I think a lot of people are reticent to participate in financial markets, maybe for good reason. Um, but I think as we make things less complicated so that they can access them, I, I think that's going to lead to better decisions. That makes sense. And um, Romano, what would what would you like to say to venture capitalists? I assume you'd like them to see your research. And what would you like them to think about and maybe take away from that? Uh, so I, I guess, the, you know, I think the the thing that's sort of interesting to factor in for VCs is a little bit of what Ashley was talking about in terms of we have preferences amongst ourselves and we ha- there's information and that information then comes with a little bit of a preference uh, and trying to think about how your own personal preference uh, is different from the information content that is there in the signal uh, and being just a bit more aware of that I think is probably a helpful thing for all of us as we rely more and more on kind of just one signal um, that is an agglomerated index of all kinds of things that are that are under the hood uh, and kind of going with the same line around transparency and simplicity. Uh, there is sometimes a, a trade-off here, right, which is the, the Product Hunt website has a very, very simple aggregation rule. They just add up the upvotes. Uh, and, and it's also pretty transparent. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're not aware about it, uh, it's uh, perhaps not the best kind of close to the truth signal. Um, but any attempts that they might make to try to fix that will always leave some residual uh, amount of uh, you know corrupt signal there. And so how do we think about that trade-off between simplicity um, and, and kind of truth uh, is, is, a, is a more meta question that I think we should all be thinking about as we rely more and more on this hard information that's coming out from these platforms. Thank you. Ashley, any last thought about all of these technologies and how they're changing the way people make their decisions? Um, I think we've talked about a lot of good and some not so good. Um, you know, and it'd be hard to sum it all up in one sentence, but but do you, how do you feel the overall impact of, of this uh, and how that's affecting people like your customers? Uh I think the overall impact is good, mm-hmm. right? You're giving people uh, more options, right? We're making sure that we're giving them digital experiences in financial services that they're used to seeing in, in sort of their personal lives, right, with other sorts of tools that they use. So it's more normalized. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here for uh, banks to do some really, really cool stuff and take advantage of this. And all of the research that I think we've heard today is sort of teasing that out, right? So it's, it's just a really exciting time, I think, to be in financial services. All right. And Jason Henricks has a question. Uh, so I'm curious because tech- technology, you know, at least starts amoral, but it can develop its own discrimination tendencies, you know, over time as you were both di- all discussing. I'm curious when we think about this, when we're trying to drive outcomes, there's a level of morality, you know, that comes into this in terms of what is the good and the welfare for the individual. And that came up in one of the prior panels and the question around payday lending and that. And I'm curious what the panelists think about that is who sets what that is and how much do we actually 
give that determinant to the individual because that also giving them tools uh, it is one thing, asking them to make other choices is another thing, but it's also a slippery slope where they can be their own worst enemy sometimes. Yeah, great question. <laughs> So the the man with the tie asks a good question. Um, <laughs> I the last time I wore a tie was when I was in DC giving a talk three years ago. So I will tell you that. Um, all right. Well, the, you're asking a, a question that is incredibly hard. And the thing is, is whose whose welfare should we be maximizing? And so academics have thought a lot about this because you know you think about maximizing the welfare of the rational person who makes the the right decisions. But then there could be somebody with a different like utility for things in life and maybe they like other things. And so I think that, you know, we really can't take a position where we're, you know, imposing, you know, a certain value system on everybody. But there are certain things that we can do. Uh, so like, for example, one of the things that I referred to in my talk was that we were trying to minimize their transactions costs, um, or minimize their fees or, you know, it, so that would increase their capacity to purchase or save in other ways. So I think that as policymakers, we can look at ways in which we can affect most people in the best way, but I don't think we're ever going to have that optimal welfare consideration because we can't impose utility on functions on people. So I agree with that, but I think it kind of interacts in in sort of interesting ways with the incentives of the players involved. Uh, so I was at a conference at HBS recently uh, on AI, um, and there was someone from the fintech industry uh, who runs a fraud prevention company, and they have to build models to determine whether there's credit card fraud in a certain transaction, okay? And the way in which um, they win contracts is that they are given a test data set by the banks, and, the, and, and that same test data set is given to five people who bid for the contract. They all run models, and the, and the model that's the best, quote-unquote, in terms of pr predicting fraud will be the one that will win. Okay, but uh, going back to all these questions around statistical discrimination that we talked about before, it's very easy to not overtly um, bring in certain factors that would, um, uh, you know, be illegal. But you can easily fall into the trap of engaging in statistical discrimination, not even for any, you know, obvious reason. You just you're kind of data mining, and it turns out that certain things turn out to be valuable, and so. That's a slippery slope, and he talked a lot about being transparent around what kinds, you know, what do you have in your models? Uh, and a lot of our AI models now, as we move from, you know, random forest to deep learning and neural networks, uh, it's really very hard to know exactly what kinds of correlations these models are picking up. And so there is actually a very hard time uh, in, in trying to figure out exactly the, the quote unquote morality behind these decisions. And so I think it's a, it's a, it's a complex and important issue, not that one that we can solve, solve, certainly not at 530 at the end of the conference, but, uh, <laughs> but a good question anyway. Uh, yeah. I mean, do we have time? Okay. We have time. Do we? Yeah, one, more, one. one more. Okay. Quick one. <laughs> quick, quick comment on what the, uh, both said, and, and, and this is a very important point, we can try our hardest to, to do all the things to improve service and reduce fees for customers, but there are some things that we don't control, and that's the irrational part. And I'll give you a case in point, very simple. In the last recession, when the level of money anxiety was high, consumers, uh, depositors, shifted money from their CDs to liquid accounts, and they lost billions of dollars in interest, in yield, because of the shift. So the shift was irrational, but they felt that they needed the money to be more accessible to them, which is a fallacy. 
But that's how they felt. So with all the good intentions and with with all the really the the attempt to help uh, uh, banking customers at certain conditions, they will make irrational decisions and still lose money. So that that's a, a good point that Bruce brought up. So there's only so much thank you can you. do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much to the panelists. This is great research. And thank you, Ashley, for all the feedback. Okay. Thank you to this panel. And one final thanks to all our speakers and panelists today, the planning committee, the event uh, team, and for you guys for sticking it out with us for such a long day. We really appreciate the engagement that you all provided. Hope you enjoyed the conference, and I would invite you for a, a brief reception in our uh, lobby now. Thank you again.